The next presenter is uh, Robert Mistrick, with the title of the presentation is Development and Utilization of Cloud-Based Library for Unknown Consumer Identification. Please go ahead, Robert. Thank you. Uh, thank you, organizers, for giving me the opportunity to talk at this meeting and start this uh, uh, compound identification session. Well, it doesn't happen very often that uh, uh, somebody asks a question before even the talk starts. And uh, Professor Fienken uh, uh, asked a very important question. Well, we can identify a lot of compounds, but uh, how they relate to the, the all wisdom from Paracelsus? Uh, we know what I'm you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, well, actually, uh, we have this privilege in Bratislava that uh, uh, famous Paracelsus visited us. Uh, and now we try to continue in his uh, work, and I actually I will address the, the question later on in my talk. Well, <laughs> you are absolutely right, we can identify uh, a sea of compounds. So this is a plasma sample, uh, LCMS uh, uh, chromatogram, and all those triangles uh, denote a component. It's probably a pure compound, but there may be some, uh, some interferences. But you see the, the complexity of, a, of a one sample. And of course, it's low with concentration. We go out and more uh, compounds we see. So therefore, I am I, absolutely convinced that in a plasma, we can see much more than uh, 800 uh, components, of course, uh, depending from the extraction and analytical methods. Uh, well, we can today identify maybe 10, maybe 15% of them. Some people claim uh, 20%. I would be rather skeptical. But still, this is a very small uh, portion of the, all compounds we can uh, uh, detect uh, in complex samples. Well, if we uh, reduce the structural space and let's say, well, uh, look only at some pharmaceuticals in a human plasma, so this is one metabolite experiment, so those are the uh, metabolites uh, which were described in the literature. And if we increase these, uh, uh, this if we enlarge this chromatogram, so we go deeper and deeper, so we see a lot of low abundant uh, components. Uh, well, uh, we, have, uh, we have here today that uh, a compound identification is a real bottleneck in a literal and extractable area. However, this, uh, this problem goes through various other scientific fields, uh, whether it's metabolomics, environmentals, and others. Uh, this is kind of a paradox because we, have, we are hearing every day that there is a Mars rover and analyzing the Mars soil. So there have been a, a mass spectrometer uh, on Jupiter falling down. There was a mass spectrometer on a, a Saturn moon and so on. Why we cannot identify the compounds on the Earth? So, and we have the sample. So we have all these instruments and uh, why it's uh, so complicated. I will try to explain you why, uh, but not to make the, uh, the even complicated story even more difficult. So I will only focus on the LCMS. So I will not touch other analytical techniques like GCMS or NMR or others. Uh, well, for many decades, the, the method of choice for compound identification was a library search. It still remains, is a very good technique. However, uh, we have a very small LCMS database. So currently, a couple of thousand compounds. If we imagine how many compounds we can search on a PubChem, it's uh, many millions. And uh, on the CAS, it's even about 100 millions. So it's a very small fraction of a compound that are represented in a, a spectral databases. Uh, today, we have uh, very cool techniques like high resolution method, but the people and software still using low resolution technique and low resolution thinking uh, uh, when using high resolution spectra. Uh, even the library search is a great technique. It has a lot of uh, uh, nuances and a lot of problems, and I would like to mention a couple of them. Uh, then we have an inherent problem with the compound identification. Well, we are actually uh, fighting a huge combinatorics, and I will explain you what does it mean to identify a compound. It's actually to somehow get under constraint uh, the combinatorics. Uh, 
Uh, today we have uh, two groups of uh, compounds, uh, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. You probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, another problem is ad hoc identification. Uh, it's extremely difficult to identify a compound if your colleague uh, will provide you a sample. Well, let's tell me what's inside without knowing the context. Where is the sample coming from? What's, uh, what's the history of the sample and so on? So to identifying a compound without uh, additional information is very difficult, if not impossible. And the last problem is the uh, promises made by computer-assisted method have not been fulfilled yet. If you take in the, uh, look in the scientific literature, you, you, you can read about uh, amazing method, automated structure elucidation, uh, machine learning method, uh, artificial intelligence use for compound identification. Well, you probably know those are overstated uh, claims and actually there is no automated uh, method for structural elucidation regardless of what you can read uh, in, a, in the scientific uh, literature. So, because, you know, the motivation of uh, academics groups is a little bit different and we have to solve the real problem. So we have a sample and we have to uh, identify the compounds and sign the results and not only produced uh, scientific papers. Well, uh, what's the problem with the library searching method? Uh, first, spectral reproducibility. Uh, in LCMS, we can acquire spectra at various uh, experimental condition. One of the uh, parameters is the isolation width. So we have here on the top uh, a spectrum acquired at isolation window four. This is isolation window uh, 1.5, so you see even though spectra are coming from the same compounds, their different spectrum is absolutely different. Neither human nor any search algorithms will recognize it as a, a identical compounds. Second uh, parameter is a collision energy. So we can acquire spectra at various collision energies and what you can see here, these are those uh, breakdown curves. This is the uh, intensity for a particular ion and this is a collision energy. So this is an ideal case where at every collision energy we have the same uh, intensity. Well, the reality looks often uh, much more complicated. So you see at various different, uh, different collision energies, we see different ion intensity. So all those spectra will be completely different. So, and that's what we have to overcome. Another problem is the spectra quality. In LCMS, you have all kinds of uh, impurities, uh, adducts, uh, coeluting peaks. Uh, it's not uh, uh, easy to get a clean spectrum, so we have to either filter the spectra or do uh, other uh, measures to, to, to clean up the spectrum. So, because you can see those spectra will never be recognized coming from the same compounds. Uh, then it is a spectra specificity. Some compounds uh, exhibit very rich nines uh, fragmentation patterns, so very good fingerprints. Some uh, fragments uh, not that uh, really, and often they produce very trivial uh, uh, neutral losses like water loss. So we, have, we can have a, a hundreds if not thousand compounds they will produce a water loss. So the spectra will be very similar. Not only the water loss, it's also the ammonium ion. Spectra ambiguity. Uh, we may have a, uh, the mass spectrometry is a great uh, technique because it can, uh, it's very sensitive, but sometimes uh, some substructural information may be completely hidden. And this is the case. So here is the a compound without a sugar moiety and with sugar moiety, the spectra are absolutely identical. So this is a so-called dark matter in mass spectrometry. So this sugar just doesn't leave any trace in a mass spectrum. Uh, then it is an isomer differentiation. We have two different compounds. Yes, very similar, but still different. Spectra are almost undistinguishable. So you have to be very careful if you get a, uh, 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 library spectra as uh, hit, so if you get a hit list, so if first compounds, it's truly your compound, so you, be, you have to be always skeptical. Uh, structural diversity, 
it's actually more intended for younger people, for students, because students don't realize how diverse our structural space is. So if we take one MZ value, for example, here, it's uh, uh, at high resolution. We calculate a possible molecular formula, and then we put this formula in a structural generator, so you see how many structures we can get, and the hard is walls full after 22%, so, so many structures. Many of them are chemical nonsense, but still you see the, the huge structural diversity, and this is a very small MZ values. As we go high up with the MZ value, the, the combinatorics get worse. Uh, then we have an accuracy issue. I will not go to the specific, but it's also not trivial. And a spectral structural relationship, well, that's what happened in a mass spectrometer. We see only few of the peaks. Why? Because of thermodynamics and because of some uh, structural um, arrangement and so on. If we change slightly the structure, maybe different fragments uh, can be seen in the spectrum. So, therefore, it doesn't mean that if we see only those peaks, that there is uh, no other fragments. That's not true. There are many other fragments, but uh, intensities are different. Okay, so uh, uh, we try to address all the problems, and we came up with a concept called spectral trees. Spectral tree is a data structure which uh, holds uh, uh, spectra acquired at various collision energy, various MS stages, and it is put uh, under one roof. Here we have a MS1, MS2, and MS3, and maybe even a lower uh, uh, MSN level. Those sheets of papers are parallel spectra. Those are spectra acquired at various collision energies coming from the same precursor. And we store all this uh, data in uh, spectral tree. We go. Uh, we went further and we adopted this concept spectral trees and implemented it in a, a mass spectral database. So you have heard today, uh, it's called MZ Cloud. MZ Cloud is a free database, so anybody of you can search there. So can copy and paste spectrum or open the spectrum and search in a MZ Cloud. It contains spectral trees, sometimes rich, sometimes we have only MS to the second spectra. And I will a little bit more introduce you to, to MZ Cloud. So we have a spectral trees, we have a associated chemical structures, we have a predicted uh, precursor uh, structures, and we see the spectra from various uh, contributors because it's very important uh, to have a spectra uh, from different experiments because you know it's better to have a two confirmation than just rely only on one contributor. Then we can also display the Berg tankers I was talking about. We do uh, for peak annotations, so we have a, a heuristic annotated peaks and quantum chemically annotated peaks. Uh, you can see the, the structural view, you can see all the uh, structures. Uh, uh, you can search the spectra, so this is a typical uh, search results where you see this is your hit list. Here's the match factor, and you can uh, combine uh, the spectra visually and also through three various uh, 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 matching algorithms or scoring algorithms. And it shows you in which peaks was actually found. And this, uh, this is actually the, the biggest power of this uh, MZ Cloud database that we try to acquire the spectra at various experimental conditions. And the search algorithms match your unknown with all the experimental condition and try to find uh, the best match. So in database, we have all the information. On the experimental side, you don't need to have all the information. We will try to, uh, to, to pair th this information and to get the best match. We collect uh, a lot of uh, metadata and we do a quantum chemical uh, prediction, which is actually unique for uh, uh, a mass spectral database. So we use uh, internal uh, computing cluster and we use also a supercomputer in America because this is a very computational demanding task. So how do we build our database? We take uh, authentic standard, then we acquire using the mass spectrometer uh, spectral tree, we put it in the database and you as a user can uh, search it for the free. So this is the current uh, stage. We are adding uh, spectra, 30 uh, spectral trees a day, so in about a year we will double this number and then we will go further. 
So, uh, more detail uh, how uh, it uh, works. We take the reference compound, we use a direct injection, and uh, we have a, a special software that controls the mass spectrometer to create all those rich spectral trees, because our philosophy is, once we have a sample, we would like to get everything from the sample. We squeeze the sample to the last drop and get spectra as, as many experimental conditions, as many uh, um, uh, uh, collision energies, as many as possible precursor ions and deeper as possible with MS end stage. Why? I will show you later. And yeah, then we process the data and they go to MZ Cloud. Once again, so this is a the software we used for generation of the spectral trees. Sometimes it takes 20 minutes. We have a spectral trees that were uh, acquired, uh, it, it took uh, seven hours to acquire such a spectral trees for one compound. But these will later pay off. Uh, we built really high quality database. This database is manually curated. Uh, we have uh, three full-time uh, curators who do uh, filtering, uh, recalibration, da data processing, extracting from the chromatogram, and, uh, and uh, uh, adding uh, meta files to, to, to our records. So we really pay a big attention to, to quality. So we have here, as I mentioned to you, filtered and recalibrated. Since recalibrated are artificially changed spectra, so we better keep them separately, and you can search in both of them. So you have a filtered spectrum, uh, and filtered and recalibrated spectrum, and the search algorithms go through uh, all of them. Uh, why we are doing it? And actually, I would like to now uh, talk more about uh, compound identification. If uh, the compound, uh, unknown compound is a database, is in a database, so well, it's not a big deal, so we will find the compound and we have it. If we do not have the compound in the database, so we have to find with other techniques. And a uh, decade ago, we have introduced this precursor ion fingerprinting method. This tries to identify uh, substructures from unknown spectra based on the analogies with other spectra. It is well known that identical fragments produce the same spectrum. Why it is? Because once we isolate a fragment, a fragment doesn't remember uh, where it is coming from, doesn't remember parent. So once we isolate a fragment and do MSN spectrum, we will always get the same spectrum. Not the same, so I would rather say matching spectrum. The only thing what the ion remembers is its internal energy and we can compensate these internal energies by spectra acquired at various uh, collision energies. So if this one would be unknown and those would be in a database, we could at least identify the substructures based on these uh, spectra. And this is the reason why we build very rich spectral trees, because we would like to build a database of uh, substructures. If we cannot identify the, the structure itself, at least we can do uh, substructures. The advantage of this method compared to other computational techniques you are reading in these uh, scientific papers is we are not doing here some strange mathematics. We are actually comparing nature against nature. So we are comparing spectrum of a substructure against spectrum of a substructure. So, and this uh, slide actually shows that it really works. So here we have a different components that uh, yield the same fragments and we have matching spectra. Another example and another example. It works well for uh, positive and negative electrospray. So, uh, how it would work? Well, we, we acquire MSN spectra of an unknown compound. We search those spectra in our uh, library in MZ Cloud. We identify the, the substructures and then we have here results. I have to admit this is an ideal case that's not uh, happened not that often, but at least this is the model how it should work. As more uh, substructures we have in our database, then better we can identify uh, the compounds. So, and this is uh, how it works uh, experimentally. So we acquire uh, using Orbitrap and Tree Robot spectral tree. 
we search this spectral tree, put in the database, and we can identify uh, the substructure. Of course, uh, the identification success is uh, heavily dependent on uh, substructures we have, uh, we have uh, in our MZ Cloud database. And we try to cover all uh, uh, application areas, so we have a couple hundreds of literables uh, and extrapolables in our database. But this is also a model how you can build your own database. So, because many of you are working in a relatively limited uh, structural space, so you are not dealing with the environmental components, you can encounter everything. Uh, so, therefore, we always recommend to build in-house database uh, of compounds that are actually all in all our company, because those substructures can be later on found in our samples. So this is an example from the metabolomics. So this is an extract uh, from our orange. So we have an unknown component here. So this is a spectral tree. Using Mass Frontier, we have extracted the, the, the tree. Then we search the tree in, uh, uh, in MZ Cloud. So this is our hit list. And this is actually the, the substructure. So we have the substructure and then we could get this routine, which may be a problem because this is exactly the, the case I was talking about, this dark matter. But at least from total unknown, we have, a, we have some substructural information. If we would search this spectrum in a normal spectral database, there would be no hit. Uh, another example, so we have searched those uh, uh, sildenafils, and we've got exactly the same, uh, using exactly the same method, this is our hit list. And, uh, and other techniques, you can do also the, the substructure search, so you can do it in a reverse order, so you actually search based on substructure search, what kind of spectra I would exhibit in my uh, sample. Um, we move this story a little bit farther, and as I mentioned to you, we do also the quantum chemical uh, predictions. Uh, we actually, we take uh, chemical structures and we try to uh, calculate uh, the fragment stability and to get uh, really high quality information uh, about our fragments. So here you see the relative electronic uh, energies for all the fragments and of course the lower the relative electronic energies, the more stable, stable the ion is. Since uh, we, have, we are using different quantum chemical techniques and every technique gives you a different answer, so therefore we uh, show those level with those uh, different colored uh, lines. So this is the most likely uh, fragment. Uh, you see, you can preview all those uh, methods on uh, MZ Cloud. Since uh, this is not uh, binary logic, the fragment is uh, this one and no other, so it's always a statistic and probability. So you see the probability for each fragment uh, uh, that we are calculating, so you can preview it there. You can see all, even the three-dimensional structures. So, so this is our typical view. Since it takes so long, it's very expensive uh, to calculate those fragments, so we are just continuously filling this information in MZ Cloud, so you will not see all the quantum chemical calculation for all the compounds. It will take us a couple of years and a lot of resources, but we, we are progressing. Oops, yeah, and red are our quantum chemically calculated fragments and blue are uh, heuristically uh, calculated fragments. So those heuristics wait to be calculated quantum chemically. Why we need those uh, high quality fragments? Well, the typical experiment in, um, in mass spectrometry is you have a, uh, you have a MZ value, uh, you search in a structural database and you would like to restrict uh, these uh, all candidates to one or a limited number of them. Using precursor ion fingerprinting, we, were, we identified those compounds and if we have a high quality fragments like this one, calculated quantum chemically, so we can with certain probability say this is this one. Uh, I have a few minutes time, so I would like to show you uh, a light version of the precursor ion fingerprinting, and this is called uh, fragment ion search. This is a typical metabolite identification experiment. 
and how it actually works. Well, if we have a parent drug and if we have a metabolite, uh, based on the precursor ion fingerprinting logic, they uh, often produce the same fragments. Yeah, because the, 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 the metabolized portion just went away and we have the same fragments. So we can compare those fragments which were uh, calculated uh, using uh, in silico prediction with the actual spectra uh, we observed. And then we can compare it either in unit resolution, but it wouldn't work very well because of the isobaric coincidence. Uh, what we really need is a high resolution. So if we identify this peak 282 in our chromatograms, we can be sure it somehow uh, is associated with the metabolite. So how it works, we take a parent drug, we generate using mass frontier uh, fragments uh, uh, on the heuristic, uh, using heuristic methods. Those are our predicted uh, ions. Then we calculate MZ values, and then we search those MZ values in a, in a chromatogram. So this is metabolite one, metabolite two. How it works in the software, just we take the, the structure, uh, we predict the fragments, we generate uh, MZ values, and then we search them in a chromatogram. This is a metabolite ID experiment. You can do it for any type of experiments. You try to find a relation with a compound with a complex sample. So it can be very well used in uh, impurity search, so because you can take the precursor compounds or all the chemicals that were used to, to produce these compounds and search them in a chromatogram. The advantage of this method is not only that it shows you the peaks that are related with your investigated compounds, it gives you also some partial uh, substructural information. And then you have to, I have to admit, you, you, you have to put it manually together and make sense of, of all these results. But at least you can see what kind of substructure belongs to which uh, chromatographic peaks. Uh, how, to, how do we do this, uh, this prediction? Of course, we cannot provide you a supercomputer to do uh, a quantum chemical calculation. So therefore, we have a desktop application called Mass Frontier, and Mass Frontier does this uh, fragment prediction. Because this is for both method I've presented you, it's very important to have a high quality uh, fragment prediction. We do it uh, based on uh, general fragmentation rules and based on the uh, uh, rules published in the literature uh, in all uh, scientific journals. So actually all, we cover now 95% uh, of all fragmentation mechanisms. So we extract the fragmentation mechanism from the literature, put it in the software, and software try to, also, uh, try to find uh, appropriate mechanism and fragment uh, the molecule based on these mechanisms. So, and as you see, so we put everything on the paper, it's uh, manually curated and it is of high quality because some of the, to, to decipher some of the fragmentation mechanism is really a challenge. And we have currently 150,000 uh, fragmentation mechanisms. So there is actually in the software is all the mass spectrometry knowledge you can use in a, in a second. So you don't need to be expert in a fragmentation, so the software does it for you. Okay, uh, in the future you have, you have heard today uh, about a compound discoverer, so which is uh, connected to MZ Cloud, and next year we will also release a Mass Frontier 8 that will also work together with, uh, with uh, MZ Cloud. And, uh, Last but not least, I would like to thank the following people because this was work of many, many groups and I would like to thank you for your attention.